Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another Dauphin Deep Dive. This is of course my mini series where I'll walk you through some recent feature or system that I've added to Dauphin, but at a much lower level down in the code in case there's something there that you can use for your project. Today's topic is Dauphin's procedural island generation system, which relies heavily on 2D noise, tile maps, and most importantly, tool scripts, which allow me to generate these islands more at design time rather than runtime and customize them so that they feel more handcrafted than your normal randomly generated map. If you like this type of content on the channel, let me know with a thumbs up. And if you've watched other devlogs where you wanna see stuff in more detail, leave that down in the comments. I'm always looking for more ideas for Dauphin deep dives because I really like making these kinds of videos. Okay, let's jump in. So as the developer of Dauphin, which is going to be a large 2D open world pixel art RPG, I want to be able to easily create interesting islands for the player to explore. And I don't want these to be islands that are created at runtime. I want to create these at basically right now, development time, and then go in and make individual changes and add points of interest that make this feel like a more handcrafted world. So how do I begin tackling this problem? The solution here is taking advantage of Godot's very capable tile map nodes, which I've actually talked about quite a bit more in depth in a previous deep dive when I talked about how to associate custom terrain data with tiles that we draw in tile maps. But the beauty of Godot's tile maps is that I can either draw tiles manually or assign them programmatically based on really any kind of logic that I want to implement. So for me as the developer, it becomes a question of telling the tile map which tile I would like placed in which position. Thankfully, I am far from the first person to run into this problem, and there is a very well-established precedent of using noise to generate height maps that can be used to represent the types of worlds that I want to build in Dauphin. And rather than pretend that I can explain all that to you, I'm gonna link this excellent article that I heavily relied on when building out some of the functions that we'll take a look at in Dauphin in just a moment. This article in particular does a great job of showing how you can take a basic noise output like this and shape it to the types of worlds that you want to create. In my case, I jumped straight down to the island section and was able to apply some of the transformations here to create the shapes that I want for Dauphin's islands. The TLDR is that we can take a noise function like this that's catered to our needs and use data from the output to tell the tile map which tiles to draw where. Jumping back to my island scene here, we can catch a glimpse of the tool that I've built to help me generate the noise required to create islands like this. And this takes the form of my elevation map. This is a scene that lives as a child of every base island and is injected into the tile map as the source of truth for where to draw individual tiles. The elevation map itself is pretty much entirely empty as a standalone scene. I wanted to be able to compose it into scenes rather than have this be always inherited into scenes so that there was no strong coupling with a particular tile map implementation. And instead I have a very flexible way of generating noise of all different shapes and sizes that I can use for scenes in Dauphin beyond just islands. As we jump into the code here, I wanna first look over at my inspector window so we can see the parameters that I've exposed to myself as the developer when I want to use this tool to generate a new map. Of course, we have the width and the height of the height map that we want to generate. We have the interval between the individual height readings, so decreasing this can kind of improve performance and reduce the memory footprint. We have generation modes of currently just flat and island in case I want something kind of very flat like the open ocean with a standard depth. And for each of these individual modes, I have a few more parameters. So for my island generation, I can seed the island, I can change the frequency and gain, and change a few more exposed parameters for very island-specific transformations that I'm making to the noise that we'll look at in a moment. Where things get really interesting here are with the three items that I conveniently skipped over, activate, generate elevation, edit mode, and the elevation data itself. Now these might look like simple Boolean fields here, but in reality, these are buttons. They act as buttons because this script is designated as a tool script with this annotation at the top, meaning that all the code below can run right here in the editor without me having to actually launch the game. So by toggling these Booleans in the editor, I can trigger code to run, 
meaning I can start to build these islands and generate this noise right here in the editor before I even run the game. So let's start at the top here and take a look at what happens when I toggle this Boolean on to activate elevation generation. To see what happens when we flip this Boolean, we can go to where this export variable is declared here in my code on line 17. You'll see that I have a getter and setter here. And what's gonna happen is when I change this value in the editor, this setter is going to be fired. And you can see that if this value is true here, I'm going to call a helper function to go ahead and generate my elevation data. This function has two jobs. The first is to set up how we want to store our elevation data, and the second is to actually move ahead and build it. In terms of storing the data, I've opted for a 2D array here. That was just a happy compromise for me between pretty easy to work with in the code and also relatively performant, perhaps more so than something like a dictionary. And you can see here, the first thing I do is just clear it out to make sure we're starting fresh then loop through my width and height to create all the rows and columns that I'm going to end up populating with data. This is where my grid interval variable comes into play here. You can see that as we decrease this grid interval, we have more entries in this array, meaning that we have more kind of granularity in our height map, but at the cost of a bigger memory footprint and more time spent iterating through this 2D array when we need it. So this is just something nice for me to be able to tweak. To kick off generation of our elevation data is very straightforward. We just match on the generation mode that we've selected and call the appropriate helper function. The build flat function is probably the easiest and is defined right here below. And you can see all I'm doing here is looping through my elevation data 2D array and populating each position with pretty much a random value between the base elevation minus the variance that I've provided and the base elevation plus the variance that I've provided. So this is great if I want to create a large square of open ocean with a depth somewhere between 80 and 120 meters, for example. My build island function is where things actually start to get fun and I start using the noise functions that we talked about briefly before. You'll see that at the top of this function, I am using a reference to fast noise. And all this is, is an instance of fast noise light, which is a helper class provided by Godot. Once I have this helper class created, I'm able to set the seed, noise type, frequency, and gain, all of which were exposed as export variables for me to tweak. And once we have the noise set up, we're able to get the value at the position in the 2D array from that fast noise instance and start to apply our various shaping functions to it to end up with a nice island shape like we saw before. I won't dive too deeply into these transformation functions because they pretty much come right from that article that we've talked about, but hopefully the function names speak for themselves a bit here. Apply island shape makes sure that as we get further away from the center of the map, the depth gets greater so that we're surrounded by water and have an island in the middle. Convert to elevation is critical for me. This is what brings a value from negative one to positive one from the noise into an actual elevation value in meters that I can use in Dauphin. And this is really important for Dauphin because I want the player to have a different gameplay experience, whether they're diving at 10 meters or 200 meters depth, or right at sea level on an island, or perhaps they've climbed up 200 meters on top of a hill or mountain. So it's really important for me to have this conversion. And smoothing water entry is just a function to help make sure that as you're walking from sand into water, basically those very small values, we have a nice smooth transition for the player. And of course, finally, after we have applied all these transformations, we assign the final value to the correct place in our 2D elevation data array. Back in the inspector, when we select our elevation map, we can see all of this in action. Our elevation data starts out as an empty 2D array here. And once we toggle activate generation on and off, it's going to have moved through all of this code that we just looked at. And next time I click on this elevation data, we will see that sure enough, it is populated with a ton of values. Back in our island scene, with the elevation data in hand in our child elevation map, it's time for the tile map to do its job and use that data to build out all the tiles here by looping through that 2D array. If I click on my tile map, you'll notice that over in the inspector, I have something that looks very familiar, a generate export variable that is a Boolean. Sure enough, if we jump into my script here, you'll see that this operates the same as this Boolean does in the elevation map. We have a setter where if the value is true and we are in the engine rather than in the game, we call a function called generate map. The generate map function is really just a kicking off point that clears out the tile map to prepare it 
it sets some things up in my water shader to apply some nice textures and features to the water. And ultimately, based on the biome that we want to build for this particular island, we call the correct draw function, in this case, draw tropical. My draw function here is pretty standard as far as programmatic tile map population goes. We loop through all of the tiles in the tile map here. For each one of those positions, we request the elevation data from the elevation map, which we've injected. And we'll come back to this function in just a moment. And once we have that elevation value, we can decide which types of tiles we want to draw. And once we have all of those set up, we can call set cells terrain connect for each of our layers here to make sure we have our nice connected terrains to create a cohesive map. Now I called out this elevation at position function here from the elevation map because it's actually doing a very important job. If you remember back when we generated that elevation data, we had the option to increase the interval at which we generated that data, basically meaning that there would be more distance between the points for which height data was created. What this could mean is that as we're looping through a given tile map, we may be requesting elevation at a location where there's not an exact elevation data defined. So we have to figure out some way to kind of interpolate between other values that we do have nearby in that elevation map. That's exactly what my elevation at position function here in my elevation map achieves. If we're looking for elevation at a position where we do have an explicit elevation defined, basically here in my base case, then we're simply able to return the elevation at that exact position. If not, then we have to look at the closest four known positions around what we've requested. In this case, the top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. Once we know the elevations at those nearby positions, we can then apply a weighting to them based on the distance of those positions from the requested position and ultimately return that weighted average as the elevation. With all that said and done, we have everything we need to build an island. So we will go ahead and do that here. We obviously have an existing example, but let's say we wanna make some tweaks. We can jump into the elevation map and for simplicity's sake, I'll just go ahead and change the seed here, which should generate some new noise. I will trigger the generation of those new values and then jump up to my tile map and toggle on generate. This will take just a moment here as we loop through all of that elevation data, select the tiles that we want and ultimately connect those terrains. But after just about five to 10 seconds here, we should see a very different island from what we see here in front of us. And sure enough, after we have patiently waited, we have a brand new, very cool looking island. Now this is initially where I stopped. I had everything I needed to generate these islands, plop them down in my ocean map, and allow the player to sail between them. However, it wasn't long before I realized there was an important piece missing here. These islands certainly look cool and they're now easy to make, but I have no way to customize them. As players explore Dauphin, I want them to be able to stumble upon areas of higher elevation on the surface of islands where they can climb up and find new loot or organisms. And same thing when they're exploring the water. I want them to swim over deeper trenches that require a higher diving level and have greater rewards. In practice, I could technically do this. If I wanted to, for example, get rid of this patch of land above the surface of the water here in the bottom right corner, what I could do is open up my elevation map, open up my elevation data, and try to find the elevation values in this 2D array that correspond to this little patch of land and move those to be less than zero. As you can imagine, that's a very cumbersome thing to do when it comes to finding those values in the 2D array and modifying them quickly. My solution for this, which I'm quite happy with, is an edit mode for my elevation map. So if I click on my elevation map and toggle on edit mode in the inspector, we'll see after a second that a ton of nodes now spawn in as children of the elevation map. And as you might expect, each of these nodes corresponds to a single entry in this elevation data 2D array. If I select one of these individual markers, you'll see up here in the inspector that it has the elevation value from that position in the array associated with it. If I were to change this value, say moving it in this case to something like negative one and save it, what's happening is that this marker is signaling back up to the elevation map parent and communicating that change into the elevation data array. So even though you can't really see it here in the inspector, that change in elevation value is being saved back to the brain here of the elevation data that again gets consumed up here by the tile map. 
What this means is that in order to remove this little island here, what I can do is select all of the elevation markers around this area. Just for simplicity's sake, I'll set these to negative one, but you can imagine I would want to kind of feather this shape out a little bit to make it look a bit more natural. But once I have these set, I can scroll back up to my elevation map. I can toggle edit mode back off so that all those child nodes don't go back into production. And then I can simply tell the tile map to regenerate itself. And after we wait for just a few moments here, the tile map will be pulling those updated values from the elevation map, and we should see this island disappear once it rebuilds itself. So sure enough, now that it has completed, that little island is completely gone. This really completes this implementation for me. Having the ability to not only generate these islands much more quickly and aesthetically than I could do by hand, but also modify them to add the personal touches that will make Dauphin's world more interesting to explore. If you really want all the details for how this works together, Cherry supporters or above on Patreon have access to all of this code in the form of a GitHub gist in my most recent Patreon post, so feel free to go check it out. That is a great segue into thanking all the folks who support this channel and Dauphin's development on Patreon. Grammy supporters this month are Samuel SVD, Jess Sargo, Kyle Van Riper, James Cooper, and David L. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next Dauphin devlog very soon.